Today we have a special guest lecture uh, from New York City. Makalu Kulen and I used to work in New York City Urban Souls Institute. And she has a very interesting experience that I thought you would really benefit from learning because she also used to live in Louisiana and she did incredible work on biodiversity and bicultural conservation. She has a background in anthropology and ethnobotany and also she's an artist and a conservationist. So uh, lots of interesting uh, combinations. And I think uh, it really fits well in our topics on <clears throat> biodiversity. And I wanted to make it more specific to uh, Louisiana, to uh, species here, and also how people influence it and influenced by. So you will see lots of cultural aspects associated with the uh, it's like biocultural really aspects. It's not just people, but also environment around us. Uh, Makala will talk more a little bit her background and uh, feel free to ask your questions, write these questions in chat. So, uh, you know, I hope you will um, participate and don't be shy. So Macaulay, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, and nice to see you all today. Um, as uh, Dr. Paltseva mentioned, I'm based in, in New York City, where I am an anthropologist. Um, I did my doctoral work at the University of Virginia. And right now I'm doing research at the Lamont Doherty Earth Institute at Columbia University on an arsenic and rice project. Um, and But this is, as Anna said, Dr. Paltseva said, we're um, many roads sort of led to this place where I'm focused on sort of soils and agricultural diversity. And so um, that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So the title of my presentation is Biodiversity and Biocultural Conservation. And I just wanna say that has, have folks, are folks familiar with the term Anthropocene? You can unmike yourself. Um, well, that's- I'm not. Kind of, no? Um, well, it's kind of what I'm gonna talk about. And you have to excuse me, this is, I've taught before, but I'm not on Zoom. So I've been a little blessed to be on the, side of it, but so this is my first uh, Zoom class of the classroom. So the Anthropocene is, you know, there are many scenes, you know, right in, in geology, the Pleistocene is a one that probably everyone knows, and they're sort of markers in geological time, sort of artifacts in the record of our earth that um, are sort of contain inflection points, information about, that could be chemical, uh, you know, about um, particulate matter in the air, um, uh, microorganisms, um, and they're also artifacts. The archaeologists kind of um, move through the earth to kind of look at the different strata. And in any case, the Anthropocene is a massive inflection point from our own species because we've impacted um, the earth in such a way that we now have created in a very short time sort of an inflection point um, in the earth. And there are different names for it, and you can kind of play around with the semantics. Some people call it the Plantationocene, some people locate it um, in uh, kind of the rise of industrialization. But basically, we're living in a moment that's between the natural and social sciences. And through your career at University of Louisiana, Louisiana Lafayette and onward, you're always going to occupy that space. Um, and there are these sort of knowledge economies that exist between uh, human and non-human worlds. Um, what we're gonna cover today are sort of this idea of biocultural conservation of food plants, looking at just kind of the sheer diversity of North America. That's the project that I worked on for many years with a kind of co-ran, it was a coalition of seven uh, national nonprofits around the United States where we documented North American agricultural biodiversity. I'm gonna share some portraits of some of these foods that are endangered um, and the, their stewards, the communities out of which they come. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about what um, Gary Napan calls ethnobiology for the future. Um, and biocultural conservation, um, it's just, it's about environmental science and science in general being relational, um, our relation to the earth and the floral flora and fauna and to each other. So I want to open the conversation by sort of understanding your relationship to your place um, 
and kind of your past and what brings you here. So I'm going to start us off with a little exercise. Um, and it is, um, let's go back to, oh, I'm actually ahead of myself here. So um, before that, um, this is kind of, these are two books that I'm really drawing on that I was um, a part of um, doing the research on and writing for. Um, and so we'll, I'll reference those throughout the talk. And actually I'm gonna start with Pablo, who's the, a uh, colleague and someone I worked with in New Orleans. Um, and he's gonna talk a little bit about um, where he's from and sort of his, his place. Every Monday night or most Monday nights when I'm in town, um, I do a I fill my table with at least 10 people and it is not a dinner party. It is supper. It is not fancy. It is red beans, rice, and cornbread. In New Orleans, red beans is the traditional Monday dish. It has to do with the domestic rhythms of 19th century New Orleans, where the slaves and domestic workers knew that Monday was wash day. So Monday was the day that they had to do the wash. So they had to have a dish that they could put on a banked fire put it in the back, let's go on a slow simmer all day. Red beans were very easy. They were, they were comparatively cheap and they could also use the ham bone that was there generally from the Sunday, the Sunday dinner. I have a pretty large oval table, oval dining table that used to be my grandmother's kitchen. Um, it was a table that my generation and my mother's generation grew up around. Um, not a fancy table. It's just, just like plain for my top, but it was just, it was, it's just a magical place. That table needs to be fed at least twice a week. It needs to have a lot of people around it. And that seemed to be a great excuse. You come for red beans and rice, bring what you want to drink. It's very casual. And because it's on a Monday, people are usually recovering from the weekend and they are looking for an excuse to just have somebody else cook for them and drink too much wine and then have a Tuesday. And so this was um, a little example before we go into the exercise of some of the types of work that I do kind of moving in between um, sort of documentation of, of plants in the landscape um, and management of landscapes and also documentation of people who are cultural stewards of um, different food ways. Um, and I wanna, because we bring ourselves to a lot of the the work that we do, whether you're an environmental science major or a sociologist, a psychologist, I want to start with um, this poem from a woman and she's actually from Kentucky, uh, Georgia Lyon. And I'll just read it quickly and then I'm going to put you in breakout rooms um, and you can talk about um, there are some prompts, of, you know, that are very similar to this, like, you know, um, where you're from, items in your home, um, voices, but I'll, let me read it out. Um, I am from clothespins, from Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I am from the dirt under the back porch, black, glistening. It tasted like beets. I am from the Forsythia bush, the Dutch elm, whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. I am from fudge and eyeglasses, from Imogene and Alifair, I'm from know-it-alls and the pass-it-ons, from perk up and pipe down. I'm from he restoreth my soul with cotton ball lamb and 10 verses I can say myself. I'm from Artemis and Billy's branch, fried corn and strong coffee. From the finger my grandfather lost to the auger, the eye my father shut to keep his sight. Under my bed was a dress box, spilling old pictures a sift of lost faces to drift beneath my dream. I am from those moments, snapped before I budded, leaf fall from the family tree. And so um, if you'd indulge me, it's a bit of an exegesis, but um, if you could just say a few lines to each other, you can put them in the chat or we can come back and sort of convene as a group just for a couple of minutes um, of just where you're from before you started this class. I don't know if you all are from Lafayette, um, what part of town, if you're from other parts of the country or the state. Um, so let's get some folks in breakout rooms. 
it's kind of the narrative around um, environment and place is sort of what I was trying to get at with Georgia Lyons poem, um, locating yourself in your work and your inquiry and research. Um, so this is a more literal example of sort of where we're from and how we mark um, in a cartographic way um, where we are and then moving back into a focus on the Gulf Coast. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share with you uh, was a little bit starting with this idea of uh, biodiversity in North America. And one of the easiest um, examples is to talk about apples. So Americans grew and ate more than 15,000 varieties of apples about a century ago. And you're kind of lucky to find a few trees representing about 1,500 apple varieties that are remaining here now. And the disappearance a lot, a lot of these heirloom apples is pretty easy to trace. It's sort of the easiest part of the story to trace because of land use patterns shifting, orchards being uh, replaced with uh, housing tracks, many reasons. Um, but one of the questions that really, really drove me and the scientists that I worked with on this project was kind of a bit more than that. Like why are, you know, at least a third of native fish from, you know, just remaining in our rivers, you know, why are they at risk of extinction? And there had never really been a comprehensive survey of how many of the wild species or stocks or ecotypes um, in North America um, that were at risk um, or in need of habitat restoration um, or needed to be recovered genetically. And so we sort of set about to inventory foods and we worked with conservation biologists and farmers and activists to kind of see what food plants um, and livestock breeds were truly at risk of being lost either ecologically or, or culturally. And so I'm going to start with a there. Here's a just a quick uh, sort of photo montage of some of the diversity. This is borage, um, cucumber flavored leaves are added to salads and cooked or made into kind of a cooling drink. And um, you've got cucumbers. This is just kind of a nice uh, species to kind of dive into because there's such diversity here. This is one that was originally bred for the markets of Chicago. Um, it was used by generations of home gardeners and canners. Um, the skins are quite thin, so they take up pickling solutions quite readily. Um, it's also disease resistant. This is a China jade cucumber that's been used by uh, communities uh, throughout the, the West Coast and in the South while the Chinese were building railroads. Um, it's from Northern China. Um, and it has sort of a sweet, nutty flavor. Um, this is a really beautiful cream colored uh, cucumber. It's a kind of shape and size of, a, of an egg. It's sort of really mild and sweet. Um, and it's just sort of really unique looking. And this is a sort of a Mexican sour gherkin cucumber. So just giving you an example of sort of the really the, the richness of kind of food plants and diversity in, in North America, which has a lot to do with our soils. Um, and this is really great in salads or can be pickled. It sort of has a lemony flavor, um, quite crisp, really great for cottage gardens, really fun to grow out with kids. This is a sickum cucumber. It's really good for keeping, um, you know, past summer it's, um, you know, it can get up to several pounds and it's, you can cook it uh, in stir fries or eat it raw. This is what it looks like inside. And this is an Armenian yardlong cucumber, also Crocemis mellow. Um, it's really deeply ribbed, um, easy to digest, uh, very uniform as well in markets. So that's just one example of the thousands of uh, fruit and vegetable varietals that we looked at. But the question kind of remains like, why is North America's sort of wealth of food diversity really rapidly disappeared? And when we, spoke with people about why this was happening, um, we kind of looked at it as sort of layers layers of an onion. So as you peel off kind of the papery skin of an onion, um, one of the reasons we've lost a lot of our biodiversity here is that you can sort of see it. There are physical changes that have altered our soils and streams and, you know, rivers have been dammed. We all know that well in the Mississippi, you know, inundating some ancient forests and cornfields while others are kind of starved for the moisture they required wetlands and valleys have been filled or paved, which increases storm runoff um, and contamination. 
clam beds have been dredged. And next layer um, of the onion, I'm gonna keep that metaphor, is sort of the biological changes. It's, um, they've occurred sometimes in tandem with the physical changes in the landscape. Other times they're independent of them. And so when I talk about biological changes um, to our biodiversity, I'm talking about weeds and diseases and parasites and plagues that have been introduced um, and have typically outcompeted or kind of consumed what people call natives or the established residents, the plants that have been here and adapted to the, to the climate, the weather. And then we have genetically modified organisms that, you know, we have, you know, contaminated some of the open pollinated corn or um, wild salmon. And then you have algal blooms that have caused red tides that maybe overwhelm seagrass beds and slow the growth of, of uh, clams. Further inside the onion, and I'm gonna just get through this onion and then we'll move on to some portraits. Um, you find another layer that's pretty hard to separate from the ones on the other side of it. So you have um, just kind of the disruption of ecological relationships. And that looks like pollinators um, and flowering plants um, are predators and their prey. So if you have, say a nectar feeding bat or bee, you know, it's the, it, that's becoming scarce. The wild or cultivated plants that they pollinate and help reproduce will decline as well. And so you have this, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, this kind of cascading effects. And the same things happen with um, larger animals. So if predators are killed off like wolves or mountain lions, um, as they've been in many places, um, certain herbivores like deer or elk start to proliferate to the point that they then damage some of the native vegetation. So everything just has a cascading effect and we have, see these disruption of relationships. And then we see the loss of diversity in our grocery stores um, and it kind of affects the nutritional status of, of a lot of us. The next layer is that of genetic erosion. And that's caused by changes in land use practices maybe changes in dietary preferences, um, some legal kind of regulatory constraints. Uh, and an example of that would be kind of maybe where a cereal producer, say in the Midwest, will be forced to grow just kind of a single hybrid variety because breweries, um, you know, customers demand a uniform product. Um, and so other varieties are driven towards extinction. And so this is where you kind of find this convergence of, you know, sort of marketing and sort of popular culture um, and sort of setting expectations about what kind of quality is or um, what value is. And there's a kind of um, reduction in sort of an appreciation of, of diversity, say for cucumbers, for example, I should say how many of you all have seen those cucumber varieties in your store, how many cucumber varieties do you typically see? You see like long one, like an English hothouse or Kirby's. So the, um, let's see, the getting towards the kind of core of this and kind of moving, then we'll move on from the metaphor, but is this really the loss of cultural and culinary traditions is, and as a reason why our biodiversity is kind of decreasing. And I think these are, um, factors that kind of biologists and those physical scientists tend to ignore. So, and it's important not to, um, because if a culture, a community forgets the multiple uses of a crop, and I'll use sorghum as an example, um, you, you, it, there's another cascading loss there. So say sorghum is used exclusively for animal feed, as opposed to people knowing that there are certain varieties that you can also serve for pressing syrup, for shaping brooms, or for making cereal and porridge. So you get this loss of local knowledge, it kind of accelerates genetic erosion because people don't recall and then, you know, don't plant or purchase this larger range. And sometimes that's related to native language um, or an immigrant dialect being lost. Um, you know, specific names that distinguish the variety of beans, say, I worked, one of our colleagues worked in North in the Carolinas um, with a lot of greasy beans and, you know, in the mountains of Appalachia. And, you know, sometimes, you know, when that information, as you all know, isn't kind of passed on, it, it's kind of lost. And then the genetic material, the actual plants are lost as well. And then the final one is kind of 
is a spiritual cause, kind of the loss of our food diversity. And the founder of the project, Gary Naphan, um, spoke about it in sort of a, a beautiful way, um, you know, that when the stability of communities um, has been disrupted, there's also a high rate of, of habitat loss um, and you know farmland loss and loss of food diversity. And so he says the real bottleneck um, to the revival of native locally grown foods is cultural. Um, you know, if we no longer believe the earth is sacred or that we're kind of blessed by the bounty around us or that we have a caretaking responsibility, then it doesn't really matter to most folks how much ecological and cultural damage is done. Um, by the way we eat or if we butcher our own meat or harvest or grind our own grain. Um, what do you all think about that in terms of um, relationships to places or, or foods? Do you agree with that or somewhat? Or I think it's um, sometimes, uh, I think it exists. I don't know that we always feel that in a kind of very personal way. Um, sometimes it's, uh, disconnect because it's in a society where maybe more removed from some of those activities so it's maybe not a conscious choice but the distance is is there so um and it could kind of reverberate back to a spiritual sort of problem or uh, issue but the the core of it is that biodiversity and kind of you know understanding plant diversity has really never been more important and um, as we all sort of figure out how to make our way through climate change and environmental degradation, and we really need to, everyone, regardless of your major or your profession in life, kind of become really effective observers of the environment um, because it, our existence here really depends on our kind of detailed knowledge of, of plants and, and their habitats. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a few foods um, and we, let's see, in particular here in the Gulf Coast, um, I think prior to this inventory, there were a few efforts made by nonprofits to kind of ensure a different plants and, you know, seafood sort of biological conservation, um, which is very important to getting them back into traditional habitats and kind of seasonal rituals. but. I guess a lot of us didn't feel confident that their survival in seed banks or zoos or botanical gardens was really enough. Um, we needed to invest sort of as much time and energy um, in assuring that sort of the cultural fabric of our food producing communities um, was, was kept healthy. Um, and so I'm gonna go through uh, a few of these um, here, has anyone had Carolina gold rice? It's sort of a, since Louisiana's in a rice, you know, you all are kind of in a rice producing region. Um, I chose this one, even though it's um, on the on the East Coast, it's sort of the grandfather of long grain rice um, in the Americas um, and Africans in the States really expertly cultivated uh, rice uh, for over a century. And it kind of became part of the first Creole cuisine. Um, and more competitive rice strains sort of entered in the U.S. market. Um, but you'll see, um, you know, it's used with red beans and rice, things that uh, folks are familiar with. This is a, a field in winter in um, Louisiana. Um, clay field peas are um, another example of uh, kind of a food that was endangered, still is. Um, and we kind of uh, created these portraits around these foods to um, increase awareness uh, about them. This was first brought um, from West African uh, coastal communities um, to the West Indies, kind of in the Gulf Coast in the 1600s. Um, and it, um, it, it is related to sea island peas and black eyed peas. And how many people on New Year's Day have black eyed peas or hop into John? Anyone? Well, it's a, it's a tradition. Um, the dry field peas are soaked so that they can be eaten the next day um, kind of to take up the good luck. Um, and it, the I, kind of the 
sort of saying comes from like children of the household are sent to hop around the table to just take up the good luck. Um, it's called Poix Pigeon in French speaking parts of Louisiana. Um, and uh, the term is now used for a combination of field peas um, rather than just the peas alone. Um, and it's uh, related to, you know, jambalaya, congri, and creoles in New Orleans. Um, and I guess that this particular one, the kind of clay field pea is one of the older types um, that is adapted to the South. Um, and it's a field pea plant that is a small bush that produces sort of, um, sort of longish narrow pods um, as uh, kind of tan elongated seeds. Um, and they just add a really dark, uh, rich color to the broth. Um, and just adaptable to a wide range of subtropical and uh, wet temperate environments. Um, and it's really only available in uh, a few seed catalogs right now, but it's a very integral part of our, our diets. Um, sassafras leaves for gumbo filet is another um, uh, food plant that we documented and, and work to preserve. Has, um, is anyone here? I, a gumbo fan, cooked with filet. You can do thumbs up, guys. I see some of you write in chats, but you can also do thumbs up. Love gumbo. I only had one gumbo with shrimps. So a shrimp, I don't think it counts like a real gumbo, right? It is, if you're from <laughs> New Orleans, right? Who <laughs> yeah, it is. I it in it is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm still a virgin. <laughs> I'm missing, I'm sorry, I'm just checking all the, all, everything in chat. I'm gonna leave my chat open. So this is Lionel Keys. Um, so the roots, um, this is just, I'm trying to just give you all a sense of some of the types of work that you can do as an environmental scientist or anthropologist or um, someone who's doing landscape restoration. And it really, um, even though we did a lot of genetic work and work um, with seed banks like Svalbard, it's really, um, it really comes down to people in relationships and the ways in which they steward and care about these plants and the way they're integrated into our lives. Not to make us, our species, the center of everything, but it really helps um, under, fill out the story because when you care about something, you also work to protect it. So the roots and the bark of sassafras, um, and I'm reading from the, the book that we, that we wrote here. So if you see my eyes go down, that's what's happening. Um, but they've been chewed for a long time by Native Americans um, for medicinal and, and, and culinary qualities. And um, it has to do with an oil. It's a kind of secondary compound called saffron. Um, and they, you all know what sassafras plants look like, right? They're, they're super great. There's something very unique about them, about their leaves. Um, it's one of my favorite plants in the landscape. So they have on the same plant, different shaped leaves. Some are like mitten shaped, like with a little thumb hanging out. Some have like, um, they're kind of um, kind of bifurcated and others are just like um, kind of globes. Um, and they've been used as a flavoring for root beers and gums and soups and soaps. Um, but the specific uh, use that we focused on here in, in Louisiana um, was as a thickener um, and a flavoring known as gumbo filet. And that's more restricted. I would say my family is from West Africa and also America, but it's, uh, we have it there as well, but it's, um, you know, sort of very specific to this place. Um, and so kind of filet is just, you know, French for the word thread. Um, and it's just become part of sort of urban Creole cuisine. Um, it's a major, it's kind of essential ingredient. Um, and it, I think people trace it back to Choctaw communities in Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana. Um, but one of the few people who still hand makes his gumbo filet um, is, you know, Lionel Keys. And there are some other occasions in Baton Rouge. Um, so there's a lot to say about, about gumbo filet. Um, but I think Mr. Keys has passed now, um, but there's a very, there's a, you know, he was taught how to plunge, the, it has to be a pecan wood 
mono or like a mall that's hollowed into the center of a cypress stump. Um, and then you, you pound it and it's very specific and you got to hit the mall dead center. He always says, you know, and they have to hear it. It's like a really solid sound, like a home run ball coming off a bat. That's what he says. And then the filet ends up much finer. Um, and you know, he, there are just a few people who know how to do it like he did. Um, it's typically, you know, within his family and they would bring their filet to the French market in New Orleans. Um, um, but you know, things have, things have declined. Let me, let me move on. So we have, let me see what time, um, the cotton patch goose, um, is another sort of one that we, we looked at, um, as well. Um, the, it's a, I don't know if anyone has a goose for Christmas, a Christmas goose, um, but this is a kind of harkens back to a time when farms were more integrated. Um, you had livestock and um, kind of fruits and vegetables and orchards. Um, I think of geese as sort of iconic in the landscape. Um, think about geese, um, you know, well, flying south or going north, um, and then in different, you know, kind of culinary preparations. Um, but you know, it's it's very much was part of a Louisiana landscape. Um, and they would kind of be put in the landscape to sort of weed crabgrass uh, from out of cotton patches and cornfields. And they would do that to eat for its supper. Um, and so it was great for the farmers. And then also, you know, they valued their eggs and the meat and the feathers for um, coats and, and bedding. But it was really um, skilled at pest and weed control and encouraged um, Southern farmers to kind of manage um, in sort of a, a way without a lot of pesticides. Um, and it really helped keep a lot of rural families fed and just reduce the amount of time they had to devote to weeding and um, hand removing their the pests from their crops. And it's a kind of small goose as um, breed as far as geese go, but it does really well in humid weather. Um, and um, Happy to answer questions uh, questions about it, but it was just an early bird of of, of the states, um, and there are fewer than about a hundred of them left now. Um, but one of the things that we did as part of this project was to institute a breeding program and you know connect with chefs and uh, grocers and uh, you know livestock managers to get it back in place. Um, the Goliath grouper is another um, individual that we used um, in, our, in our work and uh, kind of documenting the biodiversity of the country um, that's related, that's related to the Gulf. He weighs in at about, they're about 800 pounds and they can live up to 37 years. Is anyone, do we have any fishers? I know there are some, someone just from, yeah, Tibidu, I don't know if they're shrimpers or uh, fishermen, fishing families. Um, here, um, much respect, um, but they're they're enormous. Um, and what's interesting about the the Goliath grouper um, is just how much it's connected to how how we eat it. Um, so during the early 1980s, um, in Florida especially, there was um, a sandwich, um, this is a grouper sandwich. It was enormously popular um, and that popularity of it, because people loved how it was prepared and um, kind of the cultural experience of, of eating it at fish shacks and restaurants and cafes. But what also happened was um, fishing boats were equipped with long lines. Um, and so commercial fishing boats, and then they'd bring in like 25,000 gutted pounds of, of various grouper in you know a single trip. And, and so you have the sandwich craze and then you know this kind of development in, you know, on fishing boats. And so um, their numbers really um, diminished. Um, and so, you know, we're kind of, and, and the sandwiches, you know, the fish has been replaced um, with like tilapia or, or catfish, farm-raised catfish. Um, but we were sort of, um, you know, talking to a lot of the, you know, fishing families, um, the smaller fishing families and sort of the awkward, space you know that you get put into where you're trying to make a living for your family 
um, but also, um, you know, you're all the things that you all know competing against, um, you know, lar larger forces. And there's a one um, Floridian, Ken Daniels, um, his family owned three fishing boats and they use long lines to catch grouper. Um, and he, he said, and this is a long time ago, um, I, that the writing's on the wall. Um, fishermen will not survive very long if all the groupers become over harvested the way the Goliaths were. Um, he says it's not 1989 anymore. It's not 1996, it's 2006. So we have 2016, 2026 is coming up. So maybe one of you can do it for your th senior thesis, find out what happened. But he said, you know, if I'm ever gonna get my kids to college, then I'm gonna have to take care of this resource and work responsibly. 10 years ago, it was wide open, kill everything, do what you wanna do. And it's just not like that today. Um, and so, you know, what, so what should we do? We want not just to conserve, you know, you know, the Goliath grouper, um, when it can serve it for its, you know, in its own habitat, but we're also part of that habitat. And so we wanna also be able to harvest it when we need to um, eat it. Um, someone was on there who was a fishing from a fishing family. I was wondering if you had. All my family, like we all hunt and fish and they're always talking about like, man, we used to be able to come out and catch like a hundred catfish in like 30 minutes. You throw out your fishing line and you just be able to reel them in nonstop. Mm -hmm. And they're like, it's just not that uh, how it is today. Because like everyone just overfish, no one cared. Thank you for sharing that. And when you have an, a, you know, that level of abundance is sort of natural, you know, you can sell it, you can, you can eat it, you can, but it's, um, you know, how are we, like, what's our story and how are we part of the landscape? And um, I'm sure your both of your family members have ideas about how to do it without, you know, too much regulation, um, which then pulls us apart from nature as well. And, you know, you said your family also, you know, it's not a bad thing to go hunting or fishing, you know, it's what we've always done. Um, so, um, you know, we're I, with the Goliath grouper, you know, that we're not really expecting um, to recover population levels to allow, you know, kind of sustainable harvest for some time to come. Um, but we are encouraging people to you know, we, we have like a recipe for a Goliath grouper chowder and, you know, we're kind of want to kind of continue to sort of tell these stories about harvesting these fish so that we remember like what's um, what's been part of our our shores and our waters. Um, His name was Camille. Camellia the flower, but I'm named after my grandmother, and she was Camellia Marie Champagne, and our nickname was Camille. This is my great grandfather, Pierre Louis Champagne, and this is my great -grand my grandmother, Artemis Champagne. But I've got to say that I am Camellia, and that's why I know how to do this stuff. It was really hard for the Acadians when they came down here because they were not farmers. They were they, they came from a coast where the majority of them were um, fishermen and lived off of seafood, and they had to learn what was indigenous to the area that they settled in. And that came from the, the, the free men of color or the slaves that had escaped and settled and, and the Chittimachas. There's, there's a lot of stories of where the name came from. The most predominant one and the one I would I would tend to believe it's it's an Indian name and it's for the like smothered corn. The onions and tomatoes and bell pepper and 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 garlic and celery, those were um, vegetables that were common to the area and um, corn was introduced by the Indians. In Makshu we don't use celery um, and in Makshu I don't use garlic. It strictly consists of corn that you cut off the cob, and there's a system to cutting it off. You can't just shave it off. I know that there's these devices where you can cut all the kernels off of a cob. You don't use that. Then you do a three stroke, and then you turn your knife and what we call milking it to get the juice out of the, the corn. And um, um, green bell peppers, onions, and um, steamed tomatoes. These have been blanched. I'm sure you could use canned, I just don't. 
if you would buy a, a frozen cut corn or canned corn, it, it would be okay, but it wouldn't be the same. It's definitely seasonal. But we do put the corn up. I've got I've got corn put up right now. We use a blend of spices all the time. Also, with this dish that I do, it's strictly black pepper and and salt. That's it. Cajuns do not have hot food. True Cajun food is not hot. When we talk about seasoning, we're talking about seasoning. Onions, tomatoes, bell peppers, celery. The only difference from then and today is they they grow a hybrid sweet, sweet corn that we use. Um, back then, it was just, it was the early, early corn that you picked first before you let the corn start to dry for, to use it as, as feed corn for the animals. And it's, it's one of these comfort foods for, for me and for a lot in my family and a lot of people I know. It, it, it's like mashed potatoes to other people. So you don't, you don't get fancy with it. You want it to taste like what your grandmother made where our mother never taught either my sister or I how to cook is sort of an instinctive thing. You don't have to follow a recipe. You know, you, if you get the gist of it, then you go from there. Mix that all in a bowl raw, and then you get your, your cast iron pot or the heaviest pot you've got. You put a little oil in it, and when it's, I mean, right before it's going to start smoking, then you put it, you dump the whole bowl, and then you stir like crazy. Here we go. This freeze is beautiful. It just tastes better long way in the freezer. I want grease on the on the pot to form at the bottom. Thick layer of of like sort of burnt, you know, and it's called grease. And then you stir that into it. And then you cut the heat back down and just let it simmer. And there's your dish. When I was growing up, it was um, it, it was served as a side dish, but during Lent, that was a, it was a meal. It was served over rice, and uh, I still like it, prefer it that way. They have rice with everything. So um, that's something from the Southern Foodways Alliance who worked with. Um, to kind of another example of how um, we sort of fill out profiles of um, endangered foods. Um, did that ring a bell with anyone of kind of how being in the kitchen with, yeah. There are a lot of um, wheat crops that um, were introduced here and that kind of um, fell, fell out of favor. Um, there were some improved you know, varieties that w were helpful as, you know, realistic, it's hard, it's hard to farm and it, you want help with pests. And, um, and so there have been different cycles when things have come in and out of favor, but I think there's a whole system of um, that kind of shifted and started to dissolve. And so you had um, flour, flour mills, which, you know, kind of, there used to be like in about 20, over 20,000 in the US and now they're around 200. Um, you know, the, the Green Revolution, you know, it kind of transformed uh, the white Sonoran weed into a, um, you know, kind of modified strain called Sonora 64. Um, but, you know, as Gary Nepan says, you know, there's a, there was a group of um, sort of Mexican Native American gardeners um, and small farmers um, who continue to dry farm some of the Sonoran wheat, which is a, a kind of an arid adapted soft white bread wheat. Um, it's, uh, you know, planted in, in, you know, Arizona, sort of New Mexico, some folks in California are growing it out. Um, and it's, what's really cool about it is that, you know, it's the stocks are quite sturdy and kind of shade out weeds and sort of reduce the need for herbicides. And bakers really love the, the sweetness of the, of the flour. Um, it's sort of very weedy and it's kind of how they describe it. It's really good cake flour. Um, and so this is a kind of a social network map of sort of some of the food recovery. I realize I'm kind of going kind of in some detail on some of the projects. No can kind of pull back out if and just interrupt me anytime. Um, but as we're kind of documenting some of the 
you know, the foods you have, um, this chart just shows kind of like some seed savers and, and researchers who are kind of looking at sort of rates of diversity among certain crops. Um, and then the idea is to really connect with, with, with growers to get them back into the marketplace because we, I mean, we do live in a, you know, a, a market economy and, um, you know, there is a, you can grow things out um, for pleasure and for diversity and, um, but they're also need, you know, you need to be able to kind of survive in order, you know, while you're growing these, these out um, on your land. And so um, making these connections and these relationships to marketplaces, um, this is a while ago before Whole Foods was owned by Amazon, but um, the connecting with brewers, small and large, um, for whatever didn't get milled, um, you know, working with chefs at restaurants and, you know, retail grocers, um, working to create um, regional mills to get a lot of these um, different varieties um, grown out like the Sonoran wheat is just helpful because people, it's a pleasure to have a range of flavors and textures and colors in, in your food. Um, and this is kind of what we call, that's kind of the end of the portraits of some of these plants, but sort of conservation you can taste is sort of what we, how we spoke about it. Um, and it was really sort of, you know, reconnecting some of these keystone species. And we identified, you know, a couple thousand of them um, and then profiled about, you know, a little under a hundred of them. Um, but it's just a kind of way of reestablishing a cultural relevance to these plants um, and sort of think about how they can fit into a supply chain that's, that's modern. Um, and to acknowledge some of the, you know, the cultural expression that's in these foods. Um, and so we really, it was a kind of um, unusual conservation project um, because we really wanted to support the communities that were trying to make these foods part of their diets. Because oftentimes if you have an arid adapted, you know, bean, for example, you know, it also may have a low glycemic index, which kind of helps with you know, blood sugar levels. I mean, they're like, there's always a cascading kind of effect um, and reason why people um, want to hold on to some of the, the foods that are, are from their region. Um, and uh, kind of like the two students on the call, you, you were talking about um, your family uh, fishing. Um, and a lot of people feel like restoration and the sustainable use of all resources should be positively linked, and so that's one of the things that you know we've tried to do in the in the campaign. Um, and you know, um, through public programs and meals um, uh, in parks, and you know, we really tried to kind of celebrate some of the unique foods of North America, um, sort of as parts of living cultures. Um, you know, we. I won't read through all of this, but it's kind of a little bit of a chronicle of how the project started um, and something that can be replicated in Lafayette or um, in in other areas. But, you know, it was kind of it started as technical assistance to a number of communities who were doing um, wetland and woodland restoration, um, kind of on the Colorado Plateau. And they were kind of, yeah, research and extension efforts. Like, how do you... Um, sort of work together to create a benchmark for sustainable harvest, um, you know, and there was one, I didn't profile this, but there's a, the Navajo churro sheep, it could have been the cotton patch goose or um, the sassafras, but, you know, the Navajo churro sheep um, is used traditionally in weaving. They have really beautiful natural uh, colors to their to their coats, their wool, and even kind of a lavenderish color naturally. And, you know, people were interested in using the sheep um, in projects to restore forests um, and kind of reduce fire risk. Um, and, you know, and then so in reviving production of the sheep to do this kind of landscape restoration work, we also tried to, that group at Center for Sustainable Environments led by Gary Napan and a few great people, um, you know, decided also to kind of pursue niche marketing of some of, you know, 
churro, lamb, and mutton. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm talking a little bit too much. So let's, anybody want to jump in and any questions, let me know. But, um, you know, it's really, we're looking for new ways to bring bring some of these foods back in. And um, it's really about convenings. Um, you know, I mean, the mechanics of it, we're kind of creating a list of, um, and this is somewhat similar to some of the conservation work you might might do moving forward, sort of creating lists of sort of species um, and subspecies and stocks um, that in our case were documented to be edible, kind of historically used and at risk. And then we cross-referenced um, you know, that list um, with um, kind of official threatened and endangered species lists, um, which are on natureserve.org, which is a really great database if you ever wanna sort of look at sort of um, what the landscape around you is, how, how it's being kind of categorized ecologically. Um, and then we kind of targeted those species or subspecies that were, that were ranked as kind of most at risk and then sort of Kind of looked at the plant taxa and compared those to kind of compilations of you know Native American ethnobotany and um, and then we convened people in regions and we had people in what we called gumbo nations around the Gulf um, salmon nation in the Pacific Northwest um, and sort of asked them to review review some of the information with what they understood to be kind of you know regional regional practices. Um, Anyway, it revising the lists and inventories um, and um, creating profiles. Again, this is another one that's kind of closer to home. Let's see if we can get this one started. I think a lot of people forget that food doesn't just come from a grocery store. I get to see and be a part of the whole process from the plants down to the crawfish. My name is Luke Duplichin. I'm a farmer in South Louisiana, just outside of Eunice. Our crops include rice, soybeans, and crawfish. Yeah, I've been around the farm my whole life. It's, I think, maybe third generation that's been uh, in the family. And uh, when I was younger, I would just ride around and with my dad and my uncles. And then I started farming about 2004, uh, maybe a junior in high school. Our farm has a lot of things going on. We have a nice little personal garden that me and my dad keep up. But as far as commercial farming, we specialize in just a few things. My great grandfather lived here. That's why he had his place. And he, his name was Crystal Von Dupuchin. He had a he had quite a bit of property, you know, and horses and mules and stuff, and he rented part of this property to tenant farmers. So this was his place. He had a, a rice mill, a syrup mill, and he was pretty well off in other words. And when he passed away, then they divided up the property and everything. So that's how we got here. And uh, we've been farming this property ever since. The people of this region are known as the Prairie Cajuns. I'm actually studying culinary arts at SLCC in Lafayette. The quality ingredients are really important to me. Rice and gravy was. I'm gonna just pause for a second because I know that it's almost time, um, and I have so <laughs> some more slides to I'll go through. But um, I let me. Um, these are all on the Southern Foodways Alliance um, website. Um, a lot of these you can go by state, but they're um, just wonderful testimonies to um, kind of the diversity of, of Louisiana and as that relates to kind of what you'll be learning about with Dr. Paltseva, um, I feel like we have a good conversation about some of these. Um, Winona LaDuke was, she's up, up north and um, in Minnesota on the Wild Rice Lakes. Um, and I think one of the things she said when we were working with her on this project was, um, of kind of not being af afraid to sort of, um, you know, uh, connect, um, you know, the complexities of, of, of the work. So like she says here, the, the ethical, economic, you know, social, um, 
work that is kind of part of part of all of these foods because we're all sort of located like the plants in a in a specific context and so um i think you know sort of just to close i suppose after rush through this um you know it just kind of as you really move forward in in your studies and in life and work um just kind of this idea of really linking biological and and cultural diversity um in in your work, um, you know, telling your own stories, um, your family's stories, your neighbor's stories, kind of wondering, you know, kind of what makes up a, a person um, and kind of what they what they care about, um, because it'll in, inform the questions that they ask, um, and ultimately, if you you know, the the kind of work that that you do with impacts, um, you know, everyone around you in kind of multi species way. Um, and just kind of look for how, like the process of kind of how landscapes are formed because they're formed in very cultural ways um, as well as, you know, biological and ecological ways. Um, we have, you know, talked about the Anthropocene, but we, um, you know, I would just say that that's a, a very significant part of, of the work um, that, that we all are sort of called to do. So thank you for your time. And you're wild, the, the, the old wild ride I took you on. <laughs> we have uh, one great question in the chat. How do GMOs come into play with biodiversity in the food context? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I mean, it, um, in, in many ways, um, it, it tends to, you know, I guess the short answer from kind of any call, logical point of view is that it sort of reduces biodiversity. I think it gets more complicated when you speak with geneticists and, um, and farmers as well, who say that, you know, conventional breeding programs are just an earlier version of genetic, kind of genetic modification of crops. Because humans, since the start of agriculture, you know, 10,000 years ago, we've been, you know, modifying crops um, for flavor profiles, for um, look, color. And so it is along a continuum, but I would say it's, um, you know, it's, it definitely reduces the biodiversity. I think it is, and there's an economic component to it as well. And that it has to do with kind of the reproductive um, abilities of the plant. And so oftentimes, you know, there's an um, sort of a, in economics, you call it like a perverse incentive, but it's a, you have, there's, um, in order to kind of, it's not this reductionist, but to fuel the, um, you know, the sale of the seeds, a lot of this, or the genetic modification results in sterility of the plant. And so you can't save your seeds and you have to purchase them. And so you go from having, you know, some independence financially, um, because you can save your own seed once you buy some, um, and, you know, to having to purchase it every year. And so I think it's a very layered question. What do you think chance? But it's a big issue. I have a, at the Earth Institute, um, uh, Dr. Paltseva knows um, Dr. Bostic and you know, he's a you know, geochemist, he's a chemist, he does a lot of work um, genetically with rice grains. And you know, he always poses this question, he kind of pushes back. He says, you have, this is all wonderful, but all of this was done when there were just a few million people, maybe a billion people on, on earth, we're approaching like 10 billion. And if you wanna be the one to decide which, you know, 7 billion people live and which don't, because the, a lot of the modifications and the industrialization of agriculture also, an introduction of pesticides also allowed for um, longer lifespans. I mean, it's, a, it's an ethical question, right? It's pretty complicated. Um, so he says, you know, we actually need these genetically modified or kind of improved rice grains in this case because we need to be able to feed people and um, a lot of the world um, is dependent on rice, um, rice crop for the majority of their kind of nutritional intake. Um, but it's a very, again, it's like back to this like layered kind of nesting of quest of issues. Um, I don't know that, you know, do we agree with that? I, you know, we've also seen the revival of regional um, regional economies and, and farms and varieties. And I think, you know, it, that's what I would always wanna lean towards, but, you know, that's not living in a 
we also have to kind of engage the context that we're in. So you, thanks, Chance was saying that um, they're beneficial. Um, so then there's like a, yeah, that's complicated, right? Because then you have people overseas who are like, why, why should we have it? <laughs> um, get the GMOs and people have rejected them. Um, the banana pandemic, yeah, you know, the Cavendish banana, it's like the, the entire banana crop is, you know, reliant on sort of one, one cultivar. So that's a big issue chance that you're raising. Um, it's a big concern. And there are actually hundreds of varieties of bananas, but then it goes back to like our exposure. And there was a woman on the call on the Zoom um, at the very beginning, I was talking about cucumbers and how her mom would get the small ones. But, you know, it's like, it, there's a question of like, are you gonna wanna eat the small red banana that, you know, may taste like a pineapple or, you know, where's the, how do you get exposed to all of these, you know, the differences so that you have stability in the, in the stock so you don't have um, one disease that wipes everything out. Definitely bring yourselves to class and to environmental science. You all have so much knowledge about where you're from and, um, you know, how best to kind of take that place forward and, and protect it as you also travel um, and see other, other places. So um, I've heard, yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. And um, hopefully I'll see you when I'm, I'm next in, in Louisiana. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michaela. It was a pleasure to have you in the class. And if you guys any, have any questions, feel free to email them to me and I will pass them to Michaela.